All right, so that was about assessing and about um, building a human network, if you will. Now let's, I'm going to quickly, quickly run you through just uh, a few tools that we use. Uh, and this is by no means a complete list, very partial. But a few critical things that I've used in the past that helped me a great deal that may help you as well. Okay, so without going through the detail, what did I say before? A business process. No matter what function you're running, engineering, finance, sales, have a process. Have something that's repeatable. The value of this is you spend all the mental energy thinking about the hard problems and you don't waste mental energy on the routine things. As a friend of mine used to say, make the routine things routine. And then we don't have to talk about them and you save a lot of time. Make a process, write it down. And, it you know, and it, I'm not going to prescribe one for you. This one's worked for me. Um, it has to fit the needs of your business. A couple of other sort of what do I do every day kind of things. When you have a critical pro, you know, how do you run a meeting? There's all sorts of trainings you can take on running a meeting. It's really very simple. <laughs> have something to talk about. You need to have a charter. If, whether it's a meeting, whether it's a task force, whether it's a program team, whether it's a product development team, there needs to be some goal, if you will, that they have to accomplish. Talked about metrics before. How do you know how well you're doing? If you have a critical problem that you need to put a task force on, you better know when you're going to be done. Otherwise, it'll go on forever. Uh, who is responsible and who is involved? In other words, if you ever heard the expression about pigs and chickens, one of them is committed for breakfast, the other one is just involved. Um, quorum are the people who are committed. They're the ones who are accountable. They're the ones who need to be there at every meeting, and if they're not there, you can't have the meeting. Invitees are everybody who may be involved. Sure, you can come, you can listen in. Don't distract us. Uh, the very simple who, what, when plan. Again, I was um, <laughs> well into my 40s before I heard, one, heard of what one of these things are. It's the simplest thing in the world. But if you need to get stuff done, knowing who's supposed to do it, what they're supposed to do, and when it's supposed to be done by, is the most basic tool you can use. A lot of people try and get away without one. Don't. Uh, and artifacts. What are the documents we're creating? What are the, uh, the things that we have to produce? Another thing we did at Cypress a lot of is called uh, precise question and answer. Um, this basically means, how can you ask a question that can be answered? And are the people answering the question that you asked? It's a very simple concept. Has anybody wasted time in a meeting or asked a question and gotten a very lengthy and irrelevant response? Okay. Mm -hmm. See? Um, I hate that. <laughs> there are times in life to philosophize. And there are times to have very long, meandering conversations, typically over a glass of scotch. Um, typically, meetings are not one of them. So there is a, a company called uh, Vervago, I think, that has a PQ&A course. It's not only a way to communicate, it's almost a way to think. And it's a way, actually, for me to assess. Um, I mean, if I ask a question and someone won't answer me directly, I'm starting to form a little bit of opinion on how good they are. Um, so take the course or you know, read the books. They use it at Microsoft a lot. Saves enormous amounts of time. And it just becomes sort of a way I do my business every day. Now, a couple caveats. In some cultures, it's considered rude. So be respectful of cultures. Some, ple some places in the world, it's more polite to give you the context. So you, you should work with that, uh, as long as it doesn't slow you down too much. Also, do not attempt this at home. Doesn't work very well. <laughs> um, it's another experience I have. But again, when this is done well, it creates credibility, it saves time, it facilitates communication. You guys are all busy. You can't waste time philosophizing, again, unless the scotch is at hand. When it's done poorly, absolutely the opposite. It's a little bit of a trick. You, may, you should try it. I mentioned uh, dashboards and Donald Rumsfeld. Um, again, this is going to sound uh, a little classic to you, but it's really true. What you measure improves. If you get people to think just how to measure it, all of a sudden they start thinking about how to make that metric look better. It's almost automatic. Uh, I, we use a slew of dashboards. Uh, who uses, uses the Atlassian toolkit? Jira? Fantastic toolkit. Love it to death. 
We manage all of our tasks using Jira. This is not a Jira course, so we're not going to go through it. But uh, I get you know, these gorgeous dashboards um, that tell me uh, you know, where, how many bugs I've got and what, st what stage they are. Burn down charts that tell me where the team is. Um, a dashboard that I create for my peers to tell me where a product is through its development process. Just by thinking about it and writing it down, it almost automatically makes people improve it. Make people write stuff down, make people measure. Um, this is you know, my favorite bug chart that is laboriously put together. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, anybody here write software? There we go, a couple. Um, there are bugs, software is bugs, all software is bugs. You know, we classify them, a blocker, critical, major, minor, enhancement. Uh, we also categorize them, new, um, resolved, closed, reopened. Anybody know what a reopened bug is? When you thought you fixed but then you messed something else up. Exactly. Uh, well, almost. That's a regression. Right. So a reopened bug is a bug that I fixed and then I broke it later. Same bug. A regression is when I fix one bug and mess something, else, mess something else up. So we started tracking those. One of my managers had a high number of reopened bugs. We tracked them. All of a sudden, like magic, started to go down. Now, you, can, you telegraph to people what you care about by telling them what to measure. So make certain you choose it correctly. At that time, we had a big reopen problem. I wanted it stopped. We measured it. Almost magically, it went away. Great tool. OK. Uh, different type of tool. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of this before. Failure modes and effects analysis. My God, what is that? This is the best way I've ever found to try and figure out what could possibly go wrong. And you can use this on anything. Typically we use it with our hardware designs where the tools aren't quite so sophisticated as they are in software designs. But it basically, it's a fancy uh, uh, spreadsheet and you can get a copy of it off the web. But really what it does is it forces people who know something about the problem to sit together in a room and everybody has to brainstorm what could go wrong. Uh, how could it fail? It's the kind of stuff that uh, NASA does almost uh, endlessly. And then for each idea, you give it a rating. How probable is it? Can I tell if it happens? And how damaging is it if it does happen? You think back to uh, the Challenger disaster and O-rings, I know it's a long time ago. Um, FMEA could have suggested, you know what? If the O-rings go, um, the whole rocket's going to blow apart and everything's going to, um, and it'll be an enormous disaster. What's the probability of that happening and what might make it happen? Not to knock Morton Thiokol, they did their best, but this is a tool that is very, very useful to me. Uh, and can be very, very useful to you. It's a good practice to get your people, your human network, to think about what can go wrong. Fish bones. Okay, this is after it went wrong. Has anybody ever had to debug a complicated problem? A couple times? How do you think about that? Have you ever seen anybody get wrapped around the axle trying to solve a hard problem? They almost don't know where to start. You know, it's, it's failing, it fails very rarely. Well, this happens to us all the time. Uh, and what I started to insist on is, is to use a fishbone. Now, I didn't invent this. I think the uh, car industry did. Um, but it's a way to actually logically think through what the root causes could be. You have to divide them into these categories. Is it people? Is it the product itself? Is it how it was used? Is it what's going in? Um, is it, are we just, is it actually working, we're just not measuring it correctly? Um, or it's the environment in which it operates. Uh, we have a, um, <coughs> I have about two and a half million devices deployed in the UK right now um, in a smart metering world. And a couple, three years ago, we had a, um, a huge performance problem. Our head end system software would wheeze and die every night. And we had to figure out what it was. So we actually had to go through exactly this fishbone analysis. And there were bugs in the software. There were problems in the customer's environment. The database was really slow. There were a lot of things at play here. But you know, we didn't find them until we actually went through sort of the, uh, the discipline of doing this. And it doesn't just have to be technology. It can be uh, sales, customer satisfaction. 
what might be the reasons why people are unhappy with us. So this discipline actually is helpful almost everywhere. It's a nice, structured way to think about problems. So, try it.